All right, everybody, let's get started. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I'm your host, Chris Smith. I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and it's good to be with you all again for another edition of our lecture program. We've been spending every Wednesday at noon gathering right here at the museum's YouTube channel in order to meet really interesting people doing interesting things out there in the world of science and nature, conservation, education, and beyond. And of course, today is going to be no different. Now, this program is broadcast and hosted by us here at the Museum of Natural Sciences, but it's organized and coordinated by the folks at the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. So many thanks to them. We have a great partnership to bring together these programs for you every single week. In fact, there's a great archive of programs right here on the museum's YouTube channel. So look for the Lunchtime Discovery playlist here and give it a scroll, go and check it out. There's been some amazing presentations. You can learn a lot by spending some time over here on this YouTube playlist. Um, and it's been really exciting because for the last several weeks, for the month of February, we've been hearing incredible stories of conservation, communication, and education as we've celebrated Black History Month. So make sure that you go back and check some of those out as well. From through hiking the Appalachian Trail to coastal resiliency, we've been covering it all right here at the Lunchtime Discovery Series. And today, I think we're going to round out the month of February with another fantastic guest. Everybody, I want you to meet Dr. Stephanie Page. Dr. Page is the Community Engagement Manager for the Advanced... Uh, I lost my notes. I'm so sorry. Well, for the Advanced Resource and Coordination Network, my apologies, uh, and the Women in Engineering Proactive Network, and is a curator and creator of the hashtag Black and STEM community, Dr. Page, <laughs> welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to go ahead and get my screen share going so that we can jump right in. Um, I want to share that I am a North Carolinian whose family has deep roots in this state. And even with growing up in the military and living in other parts of the world, I truly call North Carolina home. Um, so it means a great deal to me to be able to share a bit of my story with you. And to start, let's talk a little bit about that family history. Um, it's only right to highlight and acknowledge who I am as it pertains to North Carolina. I am descended from people who were enslaved in Virginia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. I'm fortunate to have an awareness of my family's history, largely because our homesteads are still intact and because I grew up in close relationship with people who were raised by those who were formerly enslaved and who maintained some record of our history. On my father's side, <clears throat> Oh, excuse me, I went ahead. <laughs> On my father's side, I'm from a small place outside of Jacksonville, North Carolina called Belgrade on a homestead that was started by my great-great-grandparents. On my mother's side, High Point became home when my great-grandfather or my pop-up, who I'm showing here with little tiny me, um, moved to High Point and um, actually supported the movement of other relatives to High Point and to Detroit and Philadelphia as a part of the Great Migration. And from these experiences, community is something that has been critical to my upbringing and my sense of self. Another aspect of community goes back to me for uh, a really long time, back to just after emancipation, where the place my pop-up called home before he moved to High Point, Lancaster, South Carolina, um, was became a place where my pop-up's grandparents were part of a community that started one of the oldest black campgrounds in the country with one of the longest running annual camp meetings. And these were places that supported folks building lives and community after an emancipation. And as a way, um, in a way, folks who moved away during the Great Migration and other instances the annual camp meetings kind of remain the path back to that community and to that history. And I want to take a moment, <clears throat> excuse me, because, you know, I, I am talking about my family's lands. And it's always important for me to acknowledge the Lumbee, the Nusio, the Kori, the Shikori, the Kiawi, the Okanichi, the Sisipaha, the Washaw, the Kakaba, 
and the Chera and other First Peoples who were stewards of these lands that my family now calls home. I encourage you in, in your practice of acknowledging Indigenous First Peoples to deepen your awareness of the issues impacting them and to seek out pathways to support that are led by Indigenous and First Peoples. And I want to thank um, Drs. Heather Metcalf and Corey Welch for their efforts in moving folks beyond just land acknowledgements, but thinking more deeply about how we can stand with Indigenous and First Peoples. And I've just listed a few examples that I hope that you can look deeper into and see where you can lend your support in these efforts. Also, just in the context of STEM, it's important for me to lift up and highlight organizations that are geared toward Indigenous and First Peoples in America, ACES, and SACNAS. So I encourage you to look deeper into those organizations also. Now, I wanted to take a minute and talk a little bit about defining the STEM identity, which is a huge component of why communities such as Black and STEM arise and why they're very important. I experienced a lot in becoming a professional scientist and it wasn't always supportive or helpful. Um, sometimes it was hostile, but I also was supported and I also was loved through my curiosity and my desire to grow and become a scientist professionally. And for those of us who are from communities and populations who are historically excluded from formal STEM education and careers due to systemic oppression, it's important for me to make this point. And which is that our STEM mindedness is a part of who we are is a part of our communities and a part of our histories. It's not dictated by the formal STEM enterprises. It's not dictated by our institutions or scientific agencies or engineering agencies. I've pictured here as an example, my mother holding baby me and myself with my three brothers when we were little because it was my mom who did my first scientific experiments with me. I'm picturing here in the middle myself and my pop-up again in the hands of my grandma Crumb, my father's mother, because they were my examples of science-mindedness and STEM-mindedness. They were, while they were here with me, and I miss them very much, they were the people who displayed skills of meteorologists and engineers and medical experts. My aunt Sadie, who I've pictured um, her hands, her beautiful hands down here in the bottom, who is now 98. Um, she was my example of an ecologist and a botanist, and she was an amazing cook, just like my grandma Crumb, whose hands I mentioned are pictured up in the top right. This is how I define being STEM. And so as we go through talking about communities of being, it's important for me to anchor us and orient us to just how much who we are, how much our identities um, are tied to that. So just to give a little bit more of my background, um, as, as you can see, my North Carolina shape just behind me is filled with imagery of North Carolina a and And while I have so much love for all HBCUs, I always have to take a moment to give some shine to mine. <laughs> Uh, I graduated from a and with degrees in chemical engineering and biology. And while I was there, I experienced so many levels of community as a member of the Blue and Gold Marching Machine when Dr. Hodge was the band director. I'm spending time in McNair and Martina and Hines and Barnes and Carver Halls, um, just grinding through and getting through our degree programs and through life together. And then I went on to UNC where I earned my PhD alongside Black and other students of color, finding community in the IMSD program. And at a and and with IMSD, I began to really take ownership over defining the STEM identity for myself and realizing that my STEM identity belongs to me. Now, I've taken a moment here, um, or well, I do wanna take a moment here to highlight uh, my advisors who were, very much integral to my becoming a professional scientist and equity professional today. And also I've decided to just take a moment to highlight um, some of the black women who were so integral and loving and mentoring and just amazing to me. So um, those women that I've 
specifically decided to highlight are Dr. Margaret Knipes, who's one of the first Black women, bio, Black women biochemists I ever met. Dr. Catherine White, who is an incredible biologist, and she was just wonderful for me um, as I was working under Dr. Fouché, earning my master's degree and becoming a parent and just having that level of support. And then Dr. Baronda Montgomery, who was at the time at Michigan State, but who is now um, taking an incredible position at another institution, and Dr. Ashala, Freedom, uh, Ashala Freeman, who was a leader at IMSD. But, you know, I mentioned in my title that we're going to talk a little bit about equity. And so let's kind of get some foundational understanding but more broadly around inequity. And if you look up or Google inequity, the definition from places like Merriam-Webster and dictionary.com define it as a lack of justice or a lack of fairness. But what does that look like in the context of our education, career paths, working environments and cultures in STEM? It looks like things what that I'm showing here. So working from left to right, we see facets of the equity and findings that show, for example, that despite innovating at higher rates, minoritized graduate students are likely to have their novel contributions discounted. And they are less likely than their majoritized counterparts to obtain academic positions. There are findings such as those laid out by Ginther um, showing that black ex um, investigators, for example, are significantly less likely to obtain federal funding for STEM research. Um, the Society for Women Engineers has shown repeatedly that when looking at intersectional gender um, disparities, that women of color are not advancing in their careers in engineering sectors. And then there is also just this clear lack of consideration for disability and gender identity, especially for people of color and addressing inequities in STEM. And systems of oppression give rise to this. So I wanted to show too a little peek of data that connects more specifically to my identity. I am a black woman who earned a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. And what we see is that for a really long time, looking at this purple line, black women make up less than 2% of engineering, science and engineering degrees earned Oh, <laughs> over decades. And these numbers are still about the same even now. And when we look at that and we, we look at what else the National Science Foundation is saying about the percent of doctorates, doctoral degrees earned, these are all really low numbers. And then if we think about specifically academia, for example, and if we look at the orange bars here, um, and looking for looking at women on the right, we can see that even when we're only representing fewer than 2% of bachelor's degrees earned, that our presence is greatly diminished if you look at the advancement in the context of the academic career. Even when you're looking at aggregate numbers that are inclusive of Black, Latinx, and Indigenous women. And so what we know is that hostile environments, lack of support and resources that contributes to these types of findings. And those are things that I've both witnessed and experienced firsthand. Um, and beyond that, they're well documented in the literature. And when you think about that in the context of some common individual experiences, I've just listed like a very, very small subset here. There are a lot of things that we go through and experiencing any one of these can lead to distress, but to encounter them simultaneously on a regular basis over extended periods of time with little to no in-path support. And on top of the STEM careers being things that often reflect arduous paths, individuals can often find themselves seeking informal solutions. And one response to counter these experiences is to seek out or build community. So I always like to show this little simple community model. Um, I do think a lot about um, sort of how do I communicate what it means to be com uh, community in the context of kind of like a scholarly format. So just, you know, <laughs> bear with me for a minute. If we look at this simple model that I've represented here, we often think of a social group of people 
with commonalities such as interests, goals, and shared location being what comes together to form community. And community offers within itself various types of support in order to meet different needs. Community that is built in response to inequity takes into account unique contexts of need, particularly when community members experience ongoing, sorry about that, <laughs> ongoing prevalent injustice and unfairness. Community becomes associated with experiencing safety and security, respect and validation, belonging and inclusion, and an ability to survive and thrive. And Black and STEM was my way of cre creating community in that way that didn't limit the connection to my institution or didn't limit things to the connection um, to my institution. And that allowed me to find isolated Black STEM students and professionals all over. Now, I always have to take a minute to step back because Black and STEM wasn't created out of nothing. There was really foundational work by incredible people who made moves prior to the existence of Black and STEM to create space for Black STEM professionals. And I just want to highlight and thank Dr. Danielle Lee, who's been instrumental in documenting this history. And she was one of the first, along with Dr. Takora B. Jones, who some people might know as Mysela Phoenix the Wise, or Clifford Johnson, um, who's also known as Asymptosha, and then Dr. Lee herself. And as time went by, they were primary, primarily using like the long format blog type social media spaces. And then Twitter came about, which is more of a micro blogging space. And as Twitter developed, um, Dr. Lee was again really instrumental in moving things forward and creating space on Twitter. And so along with Dr. Danielle Lee is Dr. Tonda Prescott Weinstein, who's a cosmologist, Dr. Caleb Wilson, who's an immunologist, and Dr. Rachel Burks, who is a chemist, who are really instrumental in kind of establishing this space um, and this voice for Black STEM professionals. And then I came along in 2014. And so this month, Black and STEM is eight years old um, for Black folks who do love and teach STEM. And it was centered on being Black and STEM. That was a really important distinction for me to make as an identity. And, and the fact that we were not asking permission to own, define, or belong in that in STEM spaces. And when we talk about inequity, the experiences of inequity and how those experiences can lead to people building and shaping community, um, it was really important. It's really important for me to point out the fact that a lot coalesced and gelled in a moment that I feel was so much greater than me. I'm just very fortunate to have been the spark in this situation. And it became such a beautiful moment uh, that I continue to <laughs> reflect on. And that is always continuing to be this impactful for me um, in a way that I tend to lose words when I talk about. But to kind of get back to that community model, um, when we place Black and STEM in that, we are looking at the fact that this covered, widely covered STEM professionals and STEM educational paths. It was inclusive of social sciences and humanities. It was inclusive of educators from kindergarten through life, um, community activists, medical professionals, policy and communications professionals. And we essentially came together around several commonalities that include being black, um, the experience, experiences of living, working and learning in many different spaces in the context of our identity and our love for black folk, our cultures and broader communities. And doing this on social media meant that we could reach so many more people in so many different spaces and that a lot of people could participate in forming and shaping it. Now, when I get to um, talk a little bit about how much Black and STEM shaped me as a scientist and as an equity of professional, um, it's so hard to encapsulate everything. <laughs> It allowed me to take on a leadership role in creating community in a way that was new and more accessible to people. I was integrating my skills as a scientist with what I had learned through my background and upbringing and my valuing community. That in turn showed me how much more valuable I was as a scientist and it was incredibly affirming, 
affirming, despite how it can feel sometimes being a non-majority scientist. And it showed me that it was important and valuable for me to bring my whole self to my work as a scientist. I held space with people who understood me and my love of my work as a scientist and who made a huge difference in my, my daily life. For example, there weren't black women faculty in my department at UNC, but I found them through Black and STEM. Oh, and I do wanna share, I always love showing um, some of my work from my publications and also highlighting how much I love purple because I did sneak purple into every single paper so far that I've published. <laughs> but to highlight some of the things that we got to talk about, um, you know, and some of the things we got to do for each other, Black and STEM was part mentoring, it was part um, professional and career development and so many things that contributed to my personal development of as a scientist we were doing together as a community. And I realized I was starting to think about strategies to combine community engagement with advancing equity in my own way. And so that brings me here to um, where I am now. I had been doing equity work alongside of becoming a scientist and being a professional scientist for a while, but creating Black and STEM opened the doors to expand my equity scholarship and experience. It gave me a platform to travel the country and work with spaces like the National Academies, the National Institutes of Health, and my professional STEM societies on advancing equity in STEM. And when the moment came to choose to stay on a path of a professional scientist or choose a new career as an equity professional, the Black and STEM community was instrumental in my confidently making my choice, which brought me to ARC Network and WePAN. We Pan or the Women in Engineering Proactive Network is an organization centered on advancing equity and inclusion for women in engineering and in STEM more broadly. And the Art Network is one of We Pan's initiatives, and we're funded by the National Science Foundation to serve as a STEM equity brain trust and connect different people who are working toward advancing equity in STEM. Now, before I transition, which it's always important for me to do, to use my time to kind of give a little insight into how we can work together to advance equity. I do wanna first highlight some of the scholarship on STEM, social media and community. These are really great work. Some of them I've been able to contribute to and some of them that I, I hope you will look deeper into particularly work from Vanguard STEM um, and check out their Twitter at Vanguard STEM work from Miranda Montgomery, who I mentioned before, was just a great mentor, and it was just wonderful to meet a Black woman faculty, a biochemist as I was training, and other spaces looking at inclusive science communication. I also want to highlight some of the other discipline-specific communities for Black STEM professionals, and this is just a really small representation and collection of these groups and they're doing phenomenal work. And over the past couple of years, a lot of these groups have just accelerated work advancing equity for STEM, Black STEM professionals. So I always wanna give them a shout out. So I wanna transition a little bit for the last um, bit of the of time we have together um, and talk about advancing equity. And I thought this would be a great opportunity because I'm getting to talk to just a variety of people in today's audience who work in different places. And it's a way for me to kind of give a little bit of a tool for how we can advance equity in our own spaces and in our own ways. So one thing that I wanna anchor the conversation with is how do we think about advancing equity and why is it important that we do it in the context of social justice frameworks. And in the absence of social justice frameworks, um, words like diversity, equity, and inclusion are used without crediting sources or building on the social justice movements and theory that introduce those terms. And they can be focused more on performative action or self-promotion. And so really, if we want to do authentic DEI, we want to understand, for example, that diversity is partially rooted in, in movements addressing hiring practices, excluding racial groups. And for example, that inclusion is partially rooted 
and the historic oppression and exclusion of disabled folks in our education systems. And it's important to understand those roots and kind of connect them back to the work as we do it moving forward. Additionally, historically, the truth is that DEI and STEM has centered white, affluent, cisgendered women um, and who are abled and often excluding the most vulnerable. And a lot of, in a lot of ways that can reinforce inequity and we don't wanna do that. And we want to continue to address that so that who benefits from inequity is far more inclusive than it's historically been. And then in, also in the absence of social justice net, uh, frameworks, success in DAI is typically just defined by numbers or representation and assimilation rather than systemic change that disrupts dominant cultures and redefines belonging, productivity, and success. So what are some of these social justice frameworks? I'm only gonna highlight three um, be, and they're very important and we use them in the context of my work and my team's work and we apply them daily as equity professionals. And so I hope that this is something that's helpful for everyone to hear. So if we start with intentionality, with intentionality, we're working to cultivate individual and organizational self-awareness and action in the community to achieve STEM equity. And it's also about being purposeful and deliberate, excuse me, in aligning our strategies and behaviors with our values and taking the same purpose and approach to our broader communities. When we're talking about inclusivity, we're talking about committing to building a diverse community dedicated to creating authentic, sustainable, and equitable um, environments, especially for those who are historically marginalized and excluded. And it also includes striving to develop solutions that meet the needs of everyone, no matter where they are. <clears throat> and it includes looking beyond equality to equity. With intersectionality, we are talking about applying this critical framework for examining how systems of oppression intertwine to influence experiences and opportunities and providing continued encouragement for institutions, organizations, and researchers to disaggregate the data or to think more broadly uh, about how people are experiencing oppression and thinking creative in new ways about that. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more deeply about intersectionality because I think it's something, like as I was thinking about today's talk, like, where is this, where's their space that when I talk to people, they say, oh, can you give me a little bit more to sink my teeth into? So for today, it's intersectionality. And intersectionality is an analytical framework for examining how systems of oppression intertwine to influence experiences and opportunities. It can also be applied to developing approaches to address systems of oppression and addressing and advancing equity. And intersectionality for people who might not know was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in the late 80s. And it was initially an exploration of oppression of black women in the legal system. And I just wanna highlight um, Dr. Crenshaw and her work as a lawyer, civil rights advocate and uh, scholar of critical race theory. Intersectionality, um, I'm not gonna read this whole definition but I do wanna point you to a book by Patricia Hill Collins and Silma, Silma Bilge. Um, as a way to kind of better define and, and anchor ourselves. But I will pull a piece out that says the events and conditions of social and political life and the self can seldom, seldom be understood as shaped by one factor. And so we need to take the time to think differently when we're thinking about advancing equity. There's a lot that shapes and frames how we experience the organization of power and this is just a small list of those factors. And there are so many more to consider. Um, but, you know, thinking about where we are in different situations when it comes to being able to, to experience privilege or power and dominance is really important in the context of advancing equity. And when we look at um, power and dominance as an axis, we can already see that there are a few dynamics at play, such as gender and race and even disability or skin tone or class. And intersectionality calls us to understand how one experiences these different factors and how that it's not determined by just one factor. And it calls us to understand that many factors come together and that they also influence each other. So I just wanted to highlight that 
it is critical to deeply engage with scholarship and art, exploring intersectionality and identity even beyond the scope of STEM. Um, people who have been so incredibly influential to me um, are Alice Wong and Imani, Imani Barberin, who really have investigated and been activists around intersectionality and in examining oppression of disabled folks. And Gloria Anzaldúa, who is a Chicana um, critical theorist and fe feminist and poet who has worked with amazing people um, in her time with us, felt like Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde, whose work really included examinations of overlapping identities and different feminism. Um, I always love to take the time to point to books, um, non-fictional works, and there's some great work that is coming out and that's already out. Um, I've mentioned Dr. Chanda Wein uh, Prescott-Weinstein and her book, um, Disordered Cosmos, is an excellent, excellent read, especially for uh, those of us with interest in STEM, but regardless of your interest, it's an excellent read. Same for Lessons from Plants by Baronda Montgomery and Blair Imani's um, book coming out, Read This to Get Smarter. And also, you know, thinking about how we engage with our fictional works and, and how that also informs our understanding of intersectionality and advancing equity. And people I love to highlight are Toni Morrison, Zora Neale Hurston, Julie Dash, and Octavia Butler, and even more of our crea uh, contemporary creators. Um, and just to kind of leave you a little bit about like, if you're going out and you're in the position to influence um, strategy and development of programming and, and efforts to advance equity in your own spaces, there's some key questions that I think are, are important to ask yourselves. And I'll only pull from a couple here. Um, does your strategy focus on fixing marginalized folks rather than removing barriers? And a lot of advancing equity in STEM spaces thinks that, um, oh, we should fix the marginalized people, that there's some deficit with them as opposed to really thinking about and looking at barriers to access and barriers to resources. Um, another question is that I still ask myself is, am I oversimplifying my, my approaches by grouping people and overlooking other overlapping identities? This often comes to mind as, as we have conversations, particularly about Asian women, and we tend to think of Asian people in aggregates and not that there are expansive identities and cultures within Asian folks. And how does that mean that we then um, consider advancing equity in those specific contexts? Um, and, you know, applying intersectionality, applying these frameworks can feel really difficult. So what are a couple of bullets that I wanted to share with you about things that you can do? Um, you can engage with STEM equity scholars in social sciences and do a little bit of integrated work, which is a lot of what we do. Um, we can take more time to listen to marginalized folks about their perceived barriers to success. Um, think about whose voices we hear and whose voices inform, inform practice and policy. Um, think about how we sometimes treat umbrella terms like BIPOC or LGBTQ plus as more than just that to have a term that collects um, different marginalized identities has its uses, but it should not be the root of how we develop solutions. Um, these are individual identities with very unique and different experiences and connections to systems of oppression. And I'll leave you with um, hoping that you continue to un better understand microaggressions their impacts and how they present in your environment. And this is kind of one way that we could all really start to do some work. Um, if you're looking for one piece that I recommend and Chester Pierce is who coined this term. And he, it's such an exceptional um, context for how we experience oppression that most of the time it gets overlooked. And so microaggressions, they occur in interpersonal reinteractions and they're often subtle and yet stunning. But one reason I think it's important is that they do amount to oppression and they do impact how people experience our STEM environments and whether they feel welcome, whether they feel included and whether they feel like they belong. So with that, with my tiny lesson on <laughs> intersectionality and advancing STEM, um, I just wanna say thank you for giving me the space to tell my story 
um, to tell it in the context of why the work that I do is so important to me and to tell it in the context of, um, you know, who I am as a North Carolinian and my love for this state, uh, combining my love for science and all things STEM and just, you know, all the different aspects of my identity. So thank you so much for allowing me this space and holding this space for me today. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, folks, let's all give Dr. Page a great big round of applause. You can drop little clapping hands emojis in the chat uh, and I'll relay your appreciations back. Uh, oh, oh, everybody too, questions, comments, thoughts, drop them in the chat if you're watching on YouTube or the comments if you're watching on Facebook. I'm gonna turn to your thoughts and questions in just a moment, uh, but yeah, again, thanks so much for, for sharing all of this with us um, and bringing this, this stuff to the forefront, right? Like keeping it at the top of the pile is so important. Mm. I, thank you. I mean, it's, it's one of those um, interesting experiences, kind of how you don't leave parts of yourself behind when you do your work. And it's always interesting now when I tell my story I just always feel like, oh, I, I want to give people something that they can kind of take to their space and, and maybe influence change in their own way and better empower people. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, when we tell our stories, we hope that they uh, amount to change for those coming behind us. And so I, you know, this was such a credible and, and touching opportunity for me to do that and to you know, as I said, I, I keep going back to just how deeply connected to North Carolina I am. And, and so sort of bringing that work back to this space specifically <laughs> was such a wonderful experience. So thank you. Yeah, I love everything about that. Um, so one part of your story that, that stood out to me and that I'd love to, to learn a little bit more about was the 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 lead up to that that tweet, the roll call for the Black and STEM community, mm -hmm. um, and then and then the decision to to take that and uh, and build it into um, I don't want to say like a non academic career because you're still mm -hmm. a scientist, but mm -hmm. uh, to to not head down that uh, you know like university professor route or you know or corporate research kind of route and to, to do what you're doing today? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's so funny because I, I don't know um, how many people remember this, but but I don't know that weekend or that week that I started that tweet, uh, North Carolina was having a really nice blizzard. Just one of those that we don't normally get, you know, and if we do get it, we get it, you know, maybe once every few years, but we got like multiple that year. And, mm -hmm. um, I was at home, you know, I, oh my goodness, I can't go to lab. And, you know, I'm nearing my dissertation. So like not being able to go to lab is like, I, I'm nearing the end. And so I'm like, oh my goodness, what do I do? And, you know, I had been having a lot of interesting experiences. Um, one was that at the time, my father, um, may he rest in peace, was battling pancreatic cancer. Uh, my son was pretty young. He was in elementary school at the time. And so there was this overlap of, oh my gosh, I have all these amazing, amazing community spaces, but I also was limited in, in time and my ability to kind of be on the location on, you know, on site on this, at a certain time. Um, my life was just pulled in a number of different ways. And, um, I remember sort of just, I, I want to connect. I want to see who's out there. I want to see like how we can gel something together. And that was literally the lead up to that tweet. I just, I just want to find us. And, and it was really cool because I, I you know, I've been reading my blogs that I wrote you know, it, within those few days, and it was literally like, okay, I'm, I'm going to find maybe 60 people, and ended up finding hundreds, and it just kind of 
ended up being something where um, it wasn't just connecting to Black STEM professionals, but it actually overlapped into um, more connectivity and understanding of other marginalized groups in STEM. And so there was both kind of what was collapsing in to kind of these conversations we were having and better understanding different needs and experiences. And then this, there was just this expanded exposure to a, other marginalized groups and what were they experiencing. And then it kind of, you know, it was this really interesting snowball that got rolling because I was also doing SciComm that, you know, I was, I mentioned before we started today, I was getting to do work with Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. I was getting to do work at your museum. And, and it was just all these things were kind of rolling together. And I, and I realized they fit together. And I continued my career. I did do a couple of postdocs. I got to do really awesome work and signaling and signal transduction um, all the way to cardiovascular disease. And I, you know, I loved what I did. And at the same time, I just felt this pull, um, almost like being compelled in a different way. I had been doing academic research for 20 years. And, you know, when you look at when I first picked up a pipette to when I was making that decision, um, I felt fulfilled. I, I had my papers, I got to meet amazing people. You know, I still like to look at protein structures in my free time. Um, you know, it was just, I had, I had just had a, a phenomenal uh, career as a research scientist. And along the way, I picked up some degrees. So there was more of a sense of how do I really, really take all these pieces and how do I really think about who do I want to lend my shoulder to, to stand on? You know, all of these people who were there for me, whether it was, you know, my ancestral connections, whether it was my family, my, my grandma Crumb, my aunt Sadie, my papa, whether it was those black women, I was able to stand on the shoulders of Diane. And so I wanted to work more collectively with other people so that we could offer our shoulder together. And the way that that looks for me is, is influencing change, you know, from grade school all the way on. Um, that, that was just kind of the purpose and the form that it took for me. Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> uh, so are you ready to take some audience questions? Sure. Let's do those. They're, they're easy ones, I promise. <laughs> like, do, like, do you have advice for government agencies that are trying to be more inclusive and diverse? For instance, should they begin by defining those terms and starting those conversations? Um, absolutely. I think, you know, when it comes to government agencies, there's so many, uh, I'd say influences. Um, there are a lot of different contexts for which people are making decisions. And I really think that when we apply the framework, then we begin to see advancing equity, not as uh, some separate task, but as something that we can integrate along all of our strategies and all of our work. So when we're in government, and we begin to think about defining these terms, and we begin to think about sort of what is the mission of my agency or my specific office, then we say, well, how do we look at this mission? And how do we ensure that this mission is serving everyone, who is serving the most vulnerable people? And that has us both looking internally, like what do our teams look like? And it has us, you know, look at, you know, who informs our strategy, who informs our policy. So definitely with government, I think there are, are tons and tons of opportunities. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about is the fact that now, for example, in the White House Office of Science and Tech Policy, Alondra Nelson, who is a phenomenal social scientist, is, a, is leading that office. And what does that mean for us? It means that we have that overlapping connection of science and society as a part of the decision-making process and, a, and, and as a part of the leadership process. And so that can funnel into so many different um, levels and areas of government and, you know, 
I do, I think back to a couple of times when I was able to um, um, work with uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Richard Watkins, who started the Science Policy Advocacy Group at UNC. And we were both in grad school together. And, you know, some of what we did was we did work with um, the Board of Science and Tech for the state of North Carolina. So it was, you know, there are always spaces that we can look at our strategy and look at um, how we approach our missions in the context of where can we integrate um, equity at a foundational level. All right, excellent stuff. All right, uh, the next one comes from Catherine Daniels in the chat, who earlier shared uh, hashtag Aggie Pride. <laughs> Aggie Pride. <laughs> who, <laughs> who says, uh, okay, in your personal experience, what would you say was most instrumental or encouraging to you as a young black child interested in STEM? Catherine says they work with ages five through 18 and always want to increase impact. Oh my goodness, yeah. So I mentioned my mom, um, you know, first person who did science experiments with me. Um, but, I, but I do want to highlight one of my teachers. Um, I went to high school at Andrews High School in High Point. And my chemistry teacher, who I don't even know if he knows because I, I wasn't able to find Mr. Ray. Um, I don't know if he knows that I have a PhD in biochemistry. <laughs> um, my, you know, I had an interesting relationship with some of my teachers because a lot of times people thought that girls weren't STEM oriented or sometimes people thought that black folk weren't STEM oriented. And so there were a lot of times where I was not encouraged to pursue um, my curiosity and my connection to STEM. But Mr. Ray was my high school chemistry teacher and he noticed I connected. It wasn't just that I was good at it, I connected. I loved me some chemistry. And he, <laughs> he made sure that I went on to take AP chemistry. And there were all these different um, interests that I had in high school um, I was in student council, I marched in the band, I, I ran track. So I did all these things, but he was just like, there's something different here. And he really um, called on me to pursue that further. And so I took AP chemistry, loved it, did really well. That was heavily influential in my deciding to study chemical engineering, which was, you know, really chemical engineering is math, physics, and chemistry context. Um, and for that to come from a teacher. Um, I also wanna highlight um, for a brief period of time, I, I went to grade school, I think one year here in North Carolina, Miss Eckerd, who was my fifth grade teacher, who I am still in contact with. Um, Maria Eckerd was in my fifth grade year, she was critical to just affirming who I was. And she was so incredibly supportive and I think that um, for me, you know, I have, I have a teenager, um, teachers can make or break the spirit of our kids. And it's both something that is um, kind of undervalued and that I don't, I, I, I think our teachers are horribly under-resourced and under-supported in the work that they do. And, and they're undervalued for just the incredible impact that they can have. And Ms. Eckerd and Mr. Ray were life changers for me um, beyond what I had in terms of, of my family and the support, they were life changers for me. And so, you know, when you talk about five to 18, um, it's been important for me over the last 15 years or so to keep going back into the classroom. So, you know, reaching out to schools and saying, you know, this is what I do. I can come teach a course. I can come just meet your students. And um, it, there's just a way that it, that it has an impact to just kind of sit in front of someone who looks like you or maybe has some type of connection with you. Like sometimes I've bonded um, with younger kids over the fact that I love purple 
beyond what should be reasonable, but I have totally accepted and, and value myself for how deeply I love the color purple. Um, you know, my love of comic books, my, my love of, um, <laughs> my love of, of Play-Doh, like it, they're just all the different ways that you can kind of like bond. And, you know, uh, I think that's where we have a huge impact is just sitting and being um, with kids and affirming who they are and saying, you know, STEM is something that's really cool. And it doesn't have to be a career. It's, it's something that you have within you. And, you know, how can we help you bring that out and enjoy it? So I hope that answers your question. Excellent, excellent stuff. All right. Renee writes, how do you suggest an early career professional approach the demands of supervisors that they diversify their organization's programming? So often the idea of relationship building and really listening to communities is pushed aside or ignored for diversified numbers now. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it's a really tough piece and it's it's a part of why I highlight in you know in the talks about like do we want to be performative um, or do we want to just see numbers or do we really want to make change and a lot of times the emphasis on diversity is because it there's an outcome that people can assign to a number that they can they feel like they can get really quickly and sometimes um, the person who your leaders is reporting to, who your supervisor is reporting to, like that chain of command says, I just want to see numbers and I want to see numbers by this time. And I'd say that um, it, uh, it does overextend a person who wants to, of course, do what they're supposed to do or, or what they've been told um, they need to do to meet a certain outcome while trying to also build and maintain relationships with people. But I would say that um, trying to find someone who has uh, a level of influence, um, who understands better why relying just on numbers does not necessarily impact change, um, trying to find those people and building in networks of what I like to call influence for better, influence for change. And that can be difficult because sometimes we are isolated, but they're there. Um, I encourage you to look into the Global Center for Inclusion, which um, they do phenomenal programming, um, tends to be virtual and it tends to be something where you get, a, maybe you get a recording and you say, okay, um, to my supervisor, I think this would be really great for us to consider as we're developing strategies around DEI. Um, there are often uh, also people like um, Shani Moore, who does great work where she actually comes in and works with um, people at different levels of leadership with organizations. And she really does an amazing, she has an amazing, amazing workshop. Um, we love to host her because it is just such an in-depth workshop that considers different positions that people are in across the different STEM sectors. Um, she's used to working with corporate. She's used to working with academia. So that's another good name if you want to kind of find some more resources to help with this. But, you know, I'm, I'm here for you, here with you. It is a difficult task to take on. Um, kind of shifting attitudes away from just the emphasis on numbers. So I absolutely want to affirm where you are in that that difficult space, but I hope those resources can help you some with that. Yeah, really appreciate that answer. It, it seems like so many times uh, these efforts rely on a sole champion within an mm -hmm. institution mm -hmm. rather than them becoming a part of the institution's daily operations yeah it's, yeah it's one person's passion project and that's how the work gets done yeah but but that's too that's without it being built into the system and part of an institution then how can it how can it continue yeah yeah one person can only go yeah. for so long being yeah. being the only person yeah or the or a small team 
Yeah. And, and equity work is not easy. You are constantly engaged with in how people are experiencing inequity and injustice. And that that's a huge emotional labor too. And part of why mm-hmm. I am so thankful that Arc Network exists and that we can exist is because part of the work that we do is we connect people so that they can collaborate and work together and build these communities, not just for support, but how do we infuse resources and share things that have worked and help each other adapt things to our environment. And that's one thing that I love most because it kind of, when we reach someone who's isolated in that work and we can connect them to resources and to other people, I mean, in and of itself, you know, it. I, I just feel like that's in a way, one of the most important pieces of what we do because like you said it's so isolating and it it is such a huge emotional labor to be that champion and be that person alone often yeah and then it so often falls on the shoulders of the people who are experiencing the inequities to begin with Mm -hmm. yeah instead of the instead of the people of privilege yeah and Yeah. yeah and I think um you know, to your point, I'm, thank you so much for, for highlighting that. That is oftentimes the way that this works is that marginalized people are charged with doing the work, uh, the push for change, and they're not always, very rarely are they actually empowered and there comes with a lot of risk. And then there's also the fact that a lot of times people don't understand who are more positioned more on the side of privilege and power, how it benefits them. Um, and, and a lot of the times people kind of see it in, in a negative context. And so there's also the additional labor of like, why is this important? Why do we need to do this? Why do we need to make these pushes? And, and there's, you know, there's just a lot of work and movement to happen in that space more generally and more systemically. Um, you know, we always, we, we always spend time with each other. And when I say we are just within our community within my team kind of making sure that we're just we're okay doing the work like you know making sure that we're there to offer that support and and care for each other because it's tough and you can always jump on twitter and run a search for the hashtag black and stem and and see just amazing people yeah i i you know it I am fortunate that people call out my name, um, you know, when it comes to Black and STEM. But when I say that there are just hundreds of incredible, amazing, amazing people, um, you know, check the hashtag, check at Black and STEM um, to see it yourself. And and again, look into those other um, discipline based uh, groups because there's just there's so much there, and I love it too because. Um, another emphasis of Black and STEM is to highlight other marginalized groups and what they're doing because, you know, we didn't even get into the solidarity conversation, but that, that's an important piece of this work too. And, and how do we really kind of keep in mind um, our connectivity to each other and keep in mind like whose voices are missing so that we can make sure to keep, like, keep elevating and, and keep creating space and you know, I like to say, like, spread our elbows out so that we make a make a, a nice size gap for someone else to step into with us. So, you know, it's um, it's a great space. Uh, I just so many people there have just been just integral to my progress and and just my sense of confidence in myself and and just what we've been able to be for each other it's incredible it's it really is incredible excellent excellent stuff all right with the time we've got left uh the last one here that i have for you is uh why purple <laughs> from the chat i want to know why purple um i from a very young age uh i've loved purple my mom, um, I just, I remember one day seeing her and it's actually close to this, it's darker. It's a more, more toward like a bluish purple. She was wearing something this color and I like, it was just angelic, you know, I, and, and I fell in love with purple. 
um, probably from that moment. That's like the, the first kind of memory that I have was just my mom in this color and just, uh, you know, <laughs> and it was, um, you know, that moment of like, pure adoration for <laughs> the woman who birthed me and then she just looked glorious in this color and I've, I've loved purple scent and I fought it for a long time I will say but I no longer fight it I have a purple couch not in my living room in my office I have tons of purple shoes <laughs> I have things that you would not think you could find in purple um, people will find things in like give this we have a purple can opener like it I have so much purple I do love other colors but it's just it it makes me happy and you know when you're out doing a nature walk or doing a hike and you spot a purple flower in a field there's nothing that feels like that you know there's nothing like that purple um, streak across the sky at sunset like nothing nothing like it amazing excellent stuff <laughs> Stephanie, thanks for being on the program today. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. So glad you could be with us. Uh, viewers, glad you could be with us too. Thanks for tuning in today. Of course, we'll be back here again next Wednesday at noon on the museum's YouTube channel with another edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Uh, we're getting the entire month of March's schedule posted this week. It'll be up and ready to go very soon. Of course, the month of March, is Women's History Month, and it looks like we've got a pretty exciting lineup of amazing people that you're going to want to hear from, get their stories, insight, scientific research. It's going to be a great time. So I hope that we'll see you again here for more programs with the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Uh, Dr. Page, thank you. Thanks to the digital media team at the museum, the Office of Environmental Education, and to all of our viewers. Everybody take care, stay safe, do what you can to keep your community safe. We're still in this. And I'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody.